Good evening. I'm delighted to be introducing Robert Nerdrum's uh, wonderful book, Between Heaven and Earth. Sorry, Robert Nerdrum. Um, Between Heaven and Earth, um, A Journey with My Grandfather, the story of his grandfather, Stanley James. Um, Stanley, um, at one stage, he, um, he was a journalist and, um, and wrote for different periodicals, but he recommended that the Vatican should be moved from Italy to Dublin. And um, I couldn't have wondered what a boost that would have been to our tourist trade if it ever happened. You can see from this that um, Stanley was a maverick. He lived um, a very varied life as he was the son of a Congregationalist preacher in Wales and England. Um, he travelled to Canada where he was a cowboy. He fought in the Spanish-American War of 1898. And he returned to London where he um, took up um, the vocation of his father and grandfather and became a preacher, but a very unconventional one. And he was involved with the various social causes of the day in um, non-conscription during the First World War and um, socialism, feminism, women's suffrage. So in a way, he sort of crossed a lot of boundaries and he believed that um, Christianity and spirituality was something that should be deeply involved with in everyday life. Uh, this is a brilliant book. It's, um, it reads sometimes like a thriller. It has that sort of unputdownable quality. And I hope if you get a chance to read it, it's available at the moment just on Amazon, but it should be more widely available. So this is the flesh and bones of history, history as it affects the, the individual, a history that um, we're only just starting to learn more about now. So I'm delighted to be here tonight anyway to let, introduce Robert to you and uh, learn more about his wonderful book, Robert. Thank you very much, Patrick, for um, those uh, great words. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here in such august company, let alone to be invited by your group to make this presentation. I feel a bit of a fraud sitting here in my study in the East End of London talking to you. Let me make it clear, I'm not a historian. I don't have a PhD, and my knowledge of Irish history is embarrassingly sketchy. Um, when I look at the erudite lectures you've been attending over the last few months, I can only wonder at Liam's courage in suggesting I too give a talk. Um, he also generously uh, offered to this the book launch. So here it is, uh, Between Heaven and Earth, A Journey with My Grandfather. Um, and it came out on Monday this week on Amazon only at the moment, um, price £10. Um, for those of you lucky people still to be in the EU, about €11. Euros. So what's going on? I am merely an English hack who happens to have found out while writing his biography that my unconventional grandfather, Stanley B. James, was best friends with one of Ireland's forgotten political figures the mercurial Captain Jack White. Here I must acknowledge the huge debt I owe to Leo Keohane and Patrick Quigley himself for providing, for providing me with much of the background information on this quixotic Alsterman. It's great that they are both here tonight. Um, there is Stanley, my grandfather. I out that he also visited Ireland in September 1916 and wrote in a series of four articles for the Christian Commonwealth, a radical religious uh, journal, with extraordinary perception about the country and its future. The final Irish connection, if you like, is the fact that Stanley converted to Roman Catholicism in 1923, turning himself into one of the world's leading Catholic commentators who wrote for several Irish uh, publications. So those are the three areas where the life of the grandfather I never knew, our lives overlapped by a mere seven months, took on an Irish uh, hue. Oh yes, there is a fourth. Jess, his wife, my grandmother, was a Healy, H-E-L-E-Y, uh, -E originally from County Wicklow, whose family were farmers and millers in Wing in Buckinghamshire. 
Before exploring these points of connection, I should give you a bit of background to Stanley's earlier unorthodox life, which much of my book is devoted to. The Jameses came from Pembrokeshire before moving as farm laborers to Monmouthshire in the 18th century. Stanley was born in Bristol, son of Daniel James, a congregational minister. As Daniel on the left, Stanley, a young Stanley in the middle, and his mother Clara, who also came from a line of congregational ministers. Um, always an avid reader, uh, at secondary school in Croydon, he spent his dinner money down at the local bookstore, buying up books by Aeschylus, Walt Whitman, Ralph Emerson and Shelley, and regularly winning literature prizes with his precocious essays on the English Romantic poets. Um, here's some of his influences. I'll, I'll come to the, these, these, these men shortly. Rejecting his parents' wishes that he become a non-conformist minister, he tried to become a professional actor with disastrous results when he dried on stage in his first production. He backed off from taking the exams that would have of ministerial jobs, and he tried his hand at teaching, which he disliked. Interestingly, in his Richmond lodgings in London, however, was George Julian Harney, pictured um, here, one of the men with the, but they've all got beards, but he's the, the bottom right-hand corner. Um, he was the enfant terrible of Chartism, who was still writing trenchant articles for the Newcastle Chronicle in his 80s, um, and uh, he and Stanley became friends. He was also nodding terms with Friedrich Engels, who regularly dropped in to see his revolutionary friend Harney. Um, also in this slide, um, the man on the left is W.T. Stead. Some say he's the founder of investigative journalism uh, with the Pall Mall Gazette, and he really did do some, um, some, some great journalism work. He was at my great grandfather's church, Wimbledon Church, Congregational Church, and Stanley would have known him. And top left-hand corner, as I'm sure you know, is um, Walt Whitman, um, a great hero of Stanley's. <clears throat> and bottom right-hand corner is um, Emerson. Um, but 1887 to 1893, very turbulent years for Stanley and no job came out of this that he was happy to, to, to settle into. So when his brother Norman announced in 1893 that he was emigrating to Canada, Stanley had no hesitation in joining him. That's Norman. Um, and they set sail on the SS Parisian in 1893. Uh, they got to Alberta eventually, and that's where Stanley started his cowboy days. Um, he was a cowboy, a shepherd, a navvy, a hobo, newspaper reporter, soldier, and simultaneously war correspondent in the Spanish-American War in Puerto Rico. Also a shopkeeper, poet, and playwright. Um, and in my research, amazingly, I found three photos of him as a cowboy, just by chance, he happened to be there with a photographer turned up the branding. So in the first photo, he's the guy on the far left, helping to brand cattle. And on the one in the, on the right, he's in the middle, sitting on his horse. And this one I found later, which is um, a real gem, I think. Uh, Stanley's in the front row, the only one not wearing a hat. And the man in the back row um, on the far left is uh, John Bateman. And I met John's uh, grandson. And we, through talking, we discovered that, that our grandfathers worked next to each other on the ranch. So there were some great, um, uh, dis discoveries um, through the research. Um, finding these in Calgary's uh, Gambo Museum 
was a researcher's dream come true, more than one can hope for. Um, on returning to England in 1899, Stanley found his father dying and he took over his church without any qualifications and probably no real Christian belief. Um, he met Jess and they married, and that's Jess, my grandmother. And he did eventually become a congregation minister. And in the heady atmosphere of early 20th century North London, he seems to have embraced every revolutionary Christian movement going. Um, and there's the church, picture taken in 1906, it's still there today, just on the edge of what they call um, Old Walthamstow. At Walthamstow, he both charmed and alienated his congregation, his support for a radical movement called the New Theology, Socialism and Communism, even, and membership of the Labour Party, support for women's and men's, and come 1914, his passionate pacifism. Among those he charmed were three beautiful young women in his congregation. It was my chance discovery of hundreds of secret letters and diaries of these three women that revealed another side to him. These amazing documents, which are housed in the Women's Library of the London School of Economics, show in intriguing and explicit detail that, as a husband, and father of seven, <clears throat> Stanley had an affair and liaisons with members of his congregation. Here are two of the trio. Oops, Eva, who loved him and he loved her, and Ruth. Um, the third one, Minna, who, with whom he had an affair, I, I didn't have a photo of. <laughs> um, so, for his pacifism, and perhaps as a result of the gossip going around, he was asked to resign in the closing months of 1916. For the next six years, he joined uh, peace organizations, um, jobs perhaps for which he wasn't paid or certainly wasn't paid very much, so the, the, the family faced real poverty. At the fellowship of, uh, sorry, the No Conscription Fellowship, he worked alongside the philosopher Bertrand Russell, edited the Crusader magazine, and here's the um, masthead from January the 23rd, 1920, and he's got his name as editor there. Um, and he also, he was doing the three or four jobs at the same time. Um, he experimented with the three Catholic movement. A portrait of Lenin hung proudly above the desk of his office in the Crusader just off Fleet Street. But all the time, his columns were experimenting with Catholic ideas. And he hoped that none of his staff noticed. Um, he, Hanky says they're, they're all non-conformist Protestants and they won't understand Catholic theology. But they were far too clever for that and they noticed it. And... Um, he had a glittering array of writers um, writing for him, but one by one, there were these very turbulent editorial meetings, and one by one they resigned. Um, and eventually the proprietor sacked him, I think, in 1922. But in 23, he converted to Catholicism and reinvented himself as one of the best known Catholic writers of the English speaking world. Um, he counted G.K. Chesterton among his friends, and in 1941 was appointed deputy editor of the Catholic Herald. Um, by the time of his death, he had authored nine books, always writing from a little garden hut in rural Hampshire, then in rural Hertfordshire. Apparently, in the summer of 1951, a newly born me was taken to see him, and he blessed me. So, a very quick potted history of Stanley E. James. So let's come to the Irish theme and my grandfather's friendship, first of all, with Captain Jack White. Uh, a portrait that many of you all know, it's not many of him. 
The two men met sometime in 1915 at the Fellowship of Reconciliation, the London-based Quaker Peace Organization, and they quickly be became friends. It seems to have been a deep friendship, a real meeting of minds, and they stayed in touch for the next six years or so. So who was this man who exerted so much influence on my grandfather? A Protestant aristocrat born in 1879 with military connections. He hailed from County Antrim, was educated in England at uh, Winchester School and then Sandhurst, and fought with distinction in the Boer War. On the war's termination, he developed a dislike for the British ruling classes and resigned his commission in 1907. He traveled around Europe and Canada and for a while joined a free love commune in the English Cotswolds, which was attempting to live according to Tolstoyan deal. Spirituality played a large part in his life ever since he felt what he described as the, quote, liqueur sensation in his chest, a kind of mystical experience that stayed with him for the rest of his life. Back in Ireland, he organized one of the first Protestant pro-home rule meetings, another speaker being Sir Roger Casement. Following this initiative, White was invited to Dublin where he met James Connolly and was converted to the socialist cause. On the 23rd of November, 1913, with others, he set up the Irish Citizen Army, which was designed to offer protection to workers on picket lines from assault by the Dublin Metropolitan Police. This small group was drilled by White himself. This slide shows a stamp, postage stamp, which was before it ever was released, when it was realized that the figure pictured here on the bottom right hand corner was not white when the, the creators of the stamp thought it was. That is indeed the Irish Citizen Army in the background, um, but um, it was redrawn and never, never used. So white later made himself available to the Irish volunteers, uh, but lost faith with them when he realized how much anti-Protestant feeling there was in their ranks. This chameleon-like figure, ever changing his viewpoint, found time to get married, then announced himself a pacifist and managed to fit in a period as an ambulance driver in France. Soon after, he separated from his wife, joined Maud Gon's set in Paris, and became part of a menage a trois with an American artist and his wife. When Connolly was sentenced to death after the 1916 rising, White rushed to South Wales and tried to bring the miners out on strike to save Connolly's life. For his attempts, he was given three months imprisonment by the British. Transferred to Pentonville the day before Casement's death, White was within earshot of the hanging on the 3rd of August, 1916. After his release from prison a week later, White reconnected with my grandfather. They were remarkably similar in many ways. Both were more enamored of ideas than people, I think it's fair to say. They had a tendency to love indiscriminately and they harbored communist, even anarchic views. As a result of their conversations, and promised connection to various VIPs, Stanley's visit to Ireland was planned for September and the Christian Commonwealth commissioned him to write a series of four articles about the political state of Ireland after the Easter Rising. On the 6th of September, the paper announces that, quotes, the Reverend Stanley B. James Wardenstow has gone to Ireland to investigate the present situation, political, industrial, and religious. We believe that public opinion on this side of St George's Channel desires to understand the meaning of the Irish crisis and is still more anxious to know whether there is any hope in the near future of a healing of the wounds of Ireland and giving her unity and peace. Mr James will have opportunities of talking with the leaders of public life and of dealing positively and constructively in the light of their suggestions 
with the problems of Irish resettlement. The Easter uprising of 24th of April had not attracted the level of support from the Irish citizenry that was hoped for. But the ensuing British reprisals in May, in which 15 leaders were executed and more than 3,000 arrested, sparked widespread outrage and turned these men into martyrs. From that point, Irish independence was always gu almost guaranteed. It was an Ireland seething with resentment that Stanley entered in September. His four articles were published in successive weeks between the 4th and 25th of October, and they are, I believe, among the finest pieces of journalism he produced. In these features, he achieved a balance between the objective reporting of the opinions of the leading players, along with comments by industrial and agricultural workers, and his own views. So here's the first of the series. Um, the headline is The Rebellion and Its Political Effects. He used a description of Dublin's broken Sackville Street as a metaphor for the national confusion and lack of confidence in the Irish leaders. He wrote, the Sinn Féin upheaval has created mental chaos. Those most familiar with the country do not know where they stand or what will happen next. Uh, close quotes. But the deportation without trial of the Sinn Féin prisoners, the shooting of the leaders and the hanging of Casement in August 1916 were fatal mistakes. Casement was now regarded as a saint. Quotes, the psychology of the Irishman is different from that of the Englishman, he says. It would almost be true to say that in Ireland nothing succeeds like failure. The effect upon the nationalist element in the nation has been to stiffen its resolve to put up with no compromise, to allow no division of their beloved island. One thing is obvious. English statesmanship has failed again to settle the Irish question. The anti-English feeling has never been so strong as it is today." Close quotes. Even the Act of Parliament that granted a certain measure of self-government was an unhappy compromise that pleased nobody. The second article uh, headline, The Industrial Outlook, makes the point that the Irishman who is interested in social and economic things in terms of a regenerated national life, nationalist first, labor man second. And Stanley was told in Belfast that capital was purposely fermenting the political and religious differences in order to divide the Labour camp. Nevertheless, social reform was still dependent on a solution being found to the self-government of Ireland. He wrote, the combination of Celtic imagination and ethical idealism with a severely practical one is one of the most hopeful signs in Ireland today. The questions of political and economic independence are inextricably, inextricably mingled. Close quotes. He also gives us a snapshot of the desperate poverty when taken on a tour of Dublin slums by a trade unionist. He remarks that he has never seen such destitution. Six people commonly occupied one room. And so to the third article, um, Settlement by Conference is the headline. And he writes, there has been a great deal of foolish talk about the impossibility of a union between Catholics and Protestants and the incompatibility of the industrial spirit of the North and the poetry and mysticism of the South. What is responsible for the antipathy of the orange man to his neighbor is not the latter's Catholicism, but the assault upon his independence by the threat of compulsion now that threat has been dropped by the advanced and most determined section of home rulers. The threat now came from Westminster in the form of the strong possibility of conscription of the Irish to fight in the First World War. That now, he argued, could become the glue that unites Catholics 
and Protestants. In addition, groups such as the Irish Agricultural Organizational Society and the labor movement as a whole uh, were helping by means of shared economic activity to forge bonds between the opposing factions. His overall assessment was that the two parties were nearer unity than either knew. Settlement by conference was now a definite possibility. Um, yes, and the last one, uh, the fourth article, headlined A Vision of Destiny. He moved towards a more poetic reading of the situation. He writes, poetry here is not an exotic. It is the common possession of all. For centuries, this people has been tutored in pain. It has been under the dominion of men who understood little of the sensitive spirit they governed. But in spite of centuries of suffering, that spirit is unconquered, a gifted race, knowing the discipline of conquest, yet never servilely submitting, fulfills the main conditions of future greatness. Nations do not pass through Gethsemanes for nothing. The mountains of Erin have not heaved in order to bring forth a mouse. To be a mere Celtic appendage of an Anglo-Saxon empire is no adequate issue from this age-long crucifixion. Some greater destiny, we may be sure, awaits this people, though the method of its entertainment, of, of its attainment, may be undiscoverable at present. The first step lies with England. To this country belongs the privilege of releasing the Irish spirit to work out its destiny and to contribute of its own special gifts to the common fun of mankind. I sent the four newspaper extracts to Leo Keohane, author of Captain Jack White, Imperialism, Anarchism and the Irish Citizen Army. He replied, these are absolutely fascinating. There is an understanding in, in it that is particularly of interest, not just because Stanley is an Englishman. I doubt if there are too many locals would have had the same insights, um, but I think many historians here uh, would be surprised the, collusion, the conclusions he comes to are arrived at as early as six months after the rising. It's not known to what extent Stanley, once back in Walthamstow, was able to share his experiences of Isla Jess, his wife and my grandmother. What we do have, however, is a bizarre and amusing account by Minna Simmons, who of course we've met before. Minna is one of the trio of young women at Trinity, uh, Trinity Church in Wardenstow. She's also the sometime mistress of Stanley. In July of that year, they had had an affair which may or may not have continued into October. The historical connections now become even stranger. Minna's letter of confession to Ruth, which I'm just about to read part of, about her her affair with my grandfather was published in the Virago Book of Love Letters in 1993, immediately following a letter from Maud Gone, yes, her again, to W.B. Yeats. Minna, the nurse from Wardenstow, her letter sits in good company. So let's break off and indulge in some domestic drama before returning to our Ireland theme. Wrote to Ruth, <clears throat> I must, and this is the letter in the Virago Book of Love Letters, I must be frank and truthful to you, and so I will tell you, dear, what no other eye must ever see. What I now confess is with the deepest shame and humiliation, yet, dear, with joy, that one can feel as I have felt, is to know the very consciousness of reality. Ruth, can you love me after this? Stanley and I had a most lovely talk. Well, dear, 
We went into the front room alone and he kissed me, opened my dress and kissed my breast too. And he said how he felt I was his. He was just going away when he came back and pleaded with me, dear, to give him everything a woman can give a man. I told him I was sure we should regret it, but no, dear, anything that would make me his. Well, dear, I did. The tears I've shed have quite washed away any wrong I did. That was July, 1916. So, as we've seen, Stanley returned to London at the end of September and told Minna all about her, his trip to Ireland. Perhaps she hadn't been listening very carefully because she has difficulty recalling the salient points uh, in her letter to Ruth. She may, the prose is very um, hazy and perhaps she, she might have been drinking, we don't know. Her description to Ruth is impressionistic, a kind of stream of consciousness reflection on events in Ireland but I thought I'd share it with you as a bit of light relief. She writes, Stanley began by saying that ever since the war started, nothing had so moved him as the Sinn Féin rebellion. He felt that there was much more behind it than one could at first see, and he was only too glad to get the chance of going over and seeing for himself. As he rode down Sackville Street, one of the finest buildings in the world there, the sight was simply appalling. It could only be described as an earthquake. The post office looked like an empty tomb. Now what the dickens comes next? I'm hanged if I know. I want to give you my impressions of Ireland, which are somewhat strong, he said. And what did he say? Stanley B, come thou to me, and I will try telepathy. She went on. Well, dear, Ireland has wrongs, has had them since Adam, and even before that and they will never be righted till there arises one mighty atom named Minerva to lead them to liberty or death. Excuse me, begging a bit of the French national anthem, she writes, but are they not our allies? Brackets, all lies, a pun for a minute. Well, he said in the most pathetic voice, you always are like that when you speak of Ireland, or you ought to be. In the end, he said, all politicians want hanging. Then he went into a tea shop where there were a lot of girls, rebels. They would sure to be nice, rebel. Rebels always are. That's why I'm one, Ruth. Do be a rebel, Ruth. It makes one feel so nice. I'm sure I'll be hung. He said up one street where there was only one Sinn Féinian before. The next day there were millions. Nothing like hanging to make rebels. I quite envied Roger Casement myself. And so the letter closes. <laughs> Bizarre. In, in February 1917, Trinity's group of radicals visited the Brotherhood Church in Hackney to listen to Captain Jack White, who had been banned from re-entering Ireland and talking about his homeland. This Congregational Foundation Church paid only minimal lip service to Christianity, preferring to promote an engagingly heady mix of communism and pacifism. It had links with the ILP, pioneer of the new theology, Reverend Campbell, suffragettes, Annie Besant, Sarah Pankhurst, Keir Hardy, Bertrand Russell pictured here, and George Lansbury, among those who spoke there. Even Stanley may have um, uh, spoken there. And there is the Brotherhood Church, it no longer stands. There's a Tesco on the site. And the next slide is an intriguing one. It, the headlines, Russian revolutionaries afraid of the camera. So what's going on here? The Brotherhood Church had a rich legacy of left-wing credentials, even hosting the Fifth Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party in May 1907, uh, when 30 delegates from Russia, included, including Lenin, Trotsky and Stalin, attended. So the Hackney Gazette photographer um, spotted them walking along, so the church is on the right, and they're avoiding the camera lens as much as they can. I can't make out any particular figures. Intriguing photograph. Um, here's the, the Brotherhood Church again. 
in 2017. It was also one of the few venues which pacifists could safely book for their public meetings without any questions being asked. By now a full-blown opponent of the war, on the 28th of July 1917, the church hosted 250 pacifists, including Bertrand Russell, who gathered there for a day of action and speeches. But word got out and the hall was surrounded by an angry mob of, it said 8,000, 8, which is a huge number, many of them in military uniform. There was a forced entry and the pacifists were the victims of vicious attacks with the perpetrators throwing items of broken furniture with, with the nails deliberately exposed. The police did very little to protect them and many received severe injuries. Russell himself only escaped being badly hurt when someone whispered in a policeman's ear that he was an aristocrat, whereupon the men in blue offered him protection. I have no evidence that Stanley was among the pacifists that day, but if Russell and the other leading pacifists were there, it's possible that he was. So no doubt White would have felt at home in these revolutionary surroundings. Is it also now that he brushes shoulders with, and possibly more than just shoulders, Stanley's coterie of progressive followers? At this time, White disappears in and out of the limelight, and the early part of 1917 seems to have been one in which his actions are a bit hazy. But I suggest that what he was doing was devoting his energies towards more private concerns in North London, as ensuing letters will show. It means my talk must again take on a more domestic tone. Minna Simmons was introduced to White by Jess, my grandmother, who seems to have become quite close to him. On another occasion, she told Minna, my grandmother told Minna that White was feeling so ill that she thought he was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. To have gained such knowledge, Jess must have had access to White, which makes me wonder if the James family offered him lodgings. Once she is introduced to the charismatic White, Minna finds her feeling, feelings oscillate between attraction and revulsion. She writes to Ruth, did I ever tell you I had written to him as Captain White several times, but always burnt the letters? Well, I've written to him now, and I'll send it. I feel absolutely that I must. I have never done such a thing before. Somehow I do feel sorry for him and interested in him. Then a little bit later in the letter, I burned the letter to Captain White. The impulse has gone. After resigning, resigning from Trinity at the end of 1916, Stanley set up a radical new church in the premises of Burley Hall, Leightonston, which hosted weekly whist drives. The first service was on the 4th of March, 1917, and it was attended by the now ubiquitous Captain White. On this occasion, Minna found time to speak to him at greater lengths. I want to be charitable, she writes, Ruth. I feel I won't judge him, but Ruth, he is quite repulsive to me, and I feel he is a libertine. One or two friends, women, who didn't know anything of him, said what a horrid man, makes you feel you want a bath. Owen Abes, too, spoke of him in this way. If that's white, I don't think much of him, he told me. Gertie says he's the only man she's ever felt she'd be afraid to be left alone with. He is absolute sex. I'm surprised at Stanley, but we will wait and see. I somehow feel my own. These people are meant to come into one's life. You see, I am judging him. The 22nd of March, Minna wrote again to Ruth. Captain White asks me to tea. I am going. I do wish, Ruth, I was a bit good looking. I do feel my defects. I've been trying to grapple with the sex problem. I get so much of it. You know how he was so interested in it. Mr. James told me Captain White thinks it is the question. We can only guess how well the tea party turned out.
Time for another slide. Ah, Captain White was about to leave London, but another adventure awaited him. One that would give his, him a bizarre walk-on part in the annals of English literature. He had met D.H. Lawrence and his wife, Frida, at their London flat in early 1917, and an invitation had been extended to him to stay with them in the, in the country. He took up the offer, but the visit didn't go smoothly, and the two men argued over White's political beliefs. There's also a suggestion that there was a frisson of attra attraction between White and Frieda, which angered Lawrence. White wrote to a friend later that the novelist annoyed him and that he, White, had punched the author three times in the stomach. Ever the writer, Lawrence used the episode in his novel, Aaron's Rod, in which the character Jim Bricknell, a highly strong, impulsive character based on White, punches Rawdon Lilly, who is a self-portrait of the author. Uh, a couple more articles, and so we're going back to the Crusader when Stanley was editor. Um, he, Stanley commissioned White to write an article or two for the Crusader. This one is 1920, um, the peace journal he was editing. This one is entitled A Plea for Christian Communism, and it was published on the 26th of March, 1920. Um, and then another one, an open letter from White to the Labour Republican Free State Leaders of Ireland on the 11th of April, 1922. In it, he urges um, change that is peaceful and intelligent not violent. The Irish goal should be spiritual, that is, the harmonization of the material order with a spiritual ideal. He wrote, we need a rebirth. When finally White returned to Ireland during the War of Independence, he was left in the political wilderness and was attracted by the Communist Party of Ireland without actually ever joining. He returned to England and became involved in Sylvia Pankhurst's anti-parliamentary communist group, the Workers' Socialist Federation. And in 1934, he went back to Ireland and joined a Republican, joined a Republican Congress, a group apparently that was far to the left of the IRA. He died in 1946, but by then, my grandfather and White had long ago lost touch. One assumes that after Stanley's conversion to Catholicism in 1923, they had nothing more to talk about, not even women. Stanley's third link to Ireland, just briefly, was a religious one following that conversion. He wrote for virtually any Catholic journal that would take his articles, and he established contracts with Assisi, The Cross, and the Arab Monthly. I'm not sure which of these still exist, but as Trinity Library in Dublin has all the back copies, I spent a very pleasant two days over there digging out his pieces from the 1930s and 1940s, contained in musty volumes that probably hadn't seen the light of day for many years. Like much of what my grandfather wrote, I can't claim to have understood the theology contained within. But after I'd had my time bent beneath the library's reading lamps, it was gratifying to look out over the Trinity cricket pitch, sip a beer, and contemplate my grandfather's soft brush with Irish history 103 years ago. Um, and finally, if I may, a little slide to show you if you felt so inclined how to buy my book. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you, Robert. Uh, that was fascinating insight into your into your grandfather and his life. Uh, if anyone has any questions, they can just type them into the uh, chat box, and I will ask them to Robert. Robert, I've I've a question myself just to get the ball rolling. Um, at what point in your own uh, discovery of your grandfather and your grandfather's story did you realise that 
there was enough for quantity and, and quality uh, in his life uh, to publish a book? Well, I think I, I was setting out to write um, a um, probably slightly unremarkable sort of memoir of, of my grandfather. He, he was um, quite well known within his circle, but not, not widely. But as I, as I, as I discovered more, um, I kind to believe in it more as a, as a product uh, that might have a wider interest rather than just the family. So um, the, the book starts off, I, I, I mean, I use um, the first person singular quite a bit at the beginning, as it, but as time goes on, it becomes more of a, um, objective historical uh, look at how he was involved with, with different movements. Um, but I, because I'm writing a, a biography about somebody that's just not known, to justify doing that, I, I tried to introduce another layer or level, which was my exploration uh, alongside his. And I'm not sure if it worked, but um, that, that was the aim. Thanks. Thanks for that, Robert. Um, we had a chat, uh, brief chat before the, the lecture, and, and you're a self confessed or self proclaimed non historian, which I, I, I've trouble uh, digesting, to be honest with you, given the quality of your, of your research. Um, how did you manage to tackle that research, given that you're coming more from a literary background yourself rather than a pure historical uh, uh, or a pure historian? How did you find that journey as a researcher? Um, um, ab absolutely fascinating. Um, and it was, all, it was as, as enjoyable as writing the book. Um, it involved two trips to Canada, uh, a trip to Dublin, um, and numerous archives, and also contacting members of the family for their uh, recollections and reminiscences and, and a whole load of wonderful photographs. Um, which have not been, it's not been possible to, to use in the book, all of them. Um, try, like so many people who've written about um, someone in their family, you hear people saying, oh, I wish I'd asked them that at the time. And, and my mother and her brothers and sisters had all passed away long before I started writing this. So, um, I haven't mentioned Stanley's own writing, so nine books, two of which are autobiographies. Um, and the, the first autobiography was 1925 and the second was 1944. And he reluctantly wrote the second one, I gather, because the um, editor of the Catholic Herald, um, his name I can't recall. Um, oh, Michael de la Bedouin, that's right. Um, had read his first autobiography and, and, and didn't think it charted the progress from non-conformism to Catholicism very well and he wanted it spelt out. So um, he asked him to write a second one. And the second one is more, is more journalistic. It's, it's um, the prose is more accessible, uh, less, less spiritual in a way. Um, but I'm not sure even that really explains the, the, his decision to join the Catholic Church. So um, it, it's um, it's an interesting one. I'm, um, yeah, it's it's there's so much about it remains mystery and enigma. Thanks, Robert. Uh, I have a question uh, here from uh, Patrick Quigley, who introduced the lecture this evening, uh, and his question is: uh, He stated the book is also a family chronicle. Um, and he asked, was there any resistance into delving into any of the darker sides of your family history? Um, no, no, I, not that I know of. <laughs> um, but some, some, um, some people I contacted, some relations I contacted early, early on were, um, I think, reluctant to to get involved and um so i was just left to to do my own sessions but but on the whole people were very very cooperative um and i since the books come out um 
um, I've had some feedback, but um, I have to see what the family say when they've when they've read it. <laughs> I'm prepared for any reaction. But um, an another cousin of mine had in fact found out some of the more um, controversial aspects of what was going on in 1916. So I wasn't the first to, to get there. Thanks, Robert. Uh, I have a question from uh, Marianne Marr. Um, Mary says, excellent talk, Robert. Thank you. Not an easy task delving into such private and public part of your ancestors' history. And our question is, what was the most surprising fact you discovered about your grandfather in your research that you had not previously known about him? Sorry, you're sort of breaking up slightly, Liam. I only caught half of that. Sorry, Robert. Uh, uh, Mary Ann is asking, what was the most surprising uh, fact you discovered about your grandfather in your research that you hadn't mm. known about him? Um, well, quite obviously, it was um, the, the letters in the, in the um, library at the London School of Economics but the but from the from the three women and the diaries but the route to that was fascinating because what i haven't mentioned in this talk is that idly one day i did a google search stanley james rockies as in the rocky mountains and it threw up uh some pages of a book called the match girl and the heiress by an american historian called seth coven <clears throat> he was talking about Muriel Lester and a revolutionary Christian movement in Bow in East London. <clears throat> and she was actually the woman who hosted um, <clears throat> Gandhi in 1931. But she worked alongside my, my grandfather. And um, <clears throat> he, he quotes um, from, there's a movement that Stanley joined, which is the Voluntary Poverty Movement. And it was on page 321, I should remember it vividly. He, he, he I don't have the quote here, but um, sh um, he, he says that um, Stanley James, a man of roving ways and a cowboy in the American West, um, egregiously um, violated his Christian vow by seducing women in the vestry of the church he was in in Wardenstone. Um, and I read this, and I couldn't believe what I'd written, read on, and he, more and more of it was, was, was revealed. And his source, Coven's source, was um, another book by a woman called Teal Thompson, who had had access to Ruth's letters and diaries in, in the basement in Blackheath, and she had hoarded everything. So her diaries and her letters Eva's diaries and Eva's letters and Minna's letters were all there. And for months, she um, researched this and produced this fantastic book called Dear Friend, in which she, she focuses on the relationship between the three women. And my grandfather, I think he's mentioned 40 times in the books. He, she, he's a very important character for these women, but, but, but Teal is focusing on, <clears throat> on, the, on the women. So I, I went, to the, the women's library at the LSE and looked afresh at the, at the 10 boxes of letters and, and possessions, looking at it from my grandfather's perspective. So um, that was an incredible discovery. And just a, a sort of by the way, it was an addition in one of Eva's diaries, um, Stanley pointed her to um, run a, a, a girls group on a Wednesday evening in the church. <clears throat> Stanley's daughters and my aunts and, um, went to, to the meetings. And on one occasion, um, Eva writes that um, the meeting went particularly well. And little Kitty read a poem um, and sang a song. Um, and that is my mother, age five or six, um, recorded in the diary of a woman who loved my grandfather and her father. <laughs> I mean, it's just a bizarre. Um, and I, when I when I read this uh, letter in the hallowed confines of the women's library, I let out a, a cry of, um, and the librarian came over to check that I was all right. So I think that probably is um, um, 
the one that um, stands out first of all. Thank you, Robert. Uh, some very complimentary uh, comments coming in here. Everyone's really enjoyed the lecture. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening and sharing uh, your insight into, I think what we'd all agree is a pretty uh, remarkable uh, grandfather to have. So thank you very much. Best of luck uh, with your book and your book sales. It's available on Amazon from last Monday and I'm sure it'll do very well. A lot of people who tuned in tonight, I'm sure will be rushing off to Amazon and, and buying it on their Kindle. So thank you very much, Robert, and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Liam, for inviting me. It's been a real privilege and very enjoyable. Thank you so much. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.